Welcome to Excess Returns, where we focus on what works over the long term in the markets. Join us as we talk about the strategies and tactics that can help you become a better long-term investor. It's Justin Carboneau and Jack Forehand are principals at Validia Capital Management. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Validia Capital. No information on this podcast should be construed as investment advice. Securities discussed in the podcast may be holdings of clients of Validia Capital. Hey guys, this is Justin. In this episode of Excess Returns, we talk about quality investing. While it would seem on the surface that quality investing is easy to figure out and define, that's not necessarily the case. Jack and I talk through the various metrics on how one may try to find quality companies quantitatively. We discuss Buffett's non-quant view of quality and why quality may be best when combined with other factors like value. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoy this discussion on quality. All right, today we're going to talk about quality investing, or maybe we could consider it the quality investment factor. Um, but probably just quality investing in general, I guess. And, you know, I think quality is one of those, one of those areas of investing that a lot of people think they're, you know, investing in quality companies. It probably at like a high level, you know, when you ask people like what type of companies they want to invest in, you know, what they think of is investing in good, you know, quality, uh, sound businesses. Um, but as we've talked about, and actually, as you pointed out in your article this week, that, you know, I think from sort of maybe a quantitative perspective, it's it's probably one of the more difficult factors to try to define and understand um, for some of the reasons um, we're going to to talk about. So maybe, Jack, if you want to kind of get into, you know, the way that when, when we think about these investing factors and why they work, the reasons that they work and how quality doesn't fit nicely into one of those buckets. It's an interesting dichotomy with quality because on, on one hand, if you, if you talk to your average investor about quality or if, if you talk to them about all the investing factors. And so if I were to talk to them about value and I'd say, all right, you know, what I'm going to do for you is I'm going to buy you some cheap companies, but there's probably some significant problems in the businesses that make them cheap. Or if I talk to them about momentum, I'm going to buy stocks for you just because they're going up. And, you know, the question then would be, well, why are they going up? Well, I'm not going to even consider that. I'm just going to buy them because they're going up. Or low volatility, you know, I'm going to buy them just because they're not volatile. And, and the same questions apply with momentum. You know, why, what's going on with the business that would make me want to buy them? Well, I'm only buying them because they're not volatile. You know, all those tend to have issues to some degree with your average investor. But quality, if you start talking to investors and say, well, I'm going to buy high quality companies with high returns on capital, you know, consistent businesses over time, people love that idea. So for your average investor, quality in a lot of ways is the, the most understandable and the, the factor they're probably the most attracted to. But as you alluded to, when, for practitioners like us, it's probably the least liked factor. And the reason is because we try to find a, a re, an argument behind the scenes as to why it should work. And you know, we typically, those arguments fall into two categories. One is a risk-based argument or one is a behavioral argument. So for the risk-based argument, you know, is there an argument that these types of companies, these high quality firms are riskier than the market? You, know, you really can't make that argument. And then the behavioral argument is there should be some reason why investors should systematically misprice these securities. So for example, with value, investors tend to overestimate the problems with value firms and you know, bid the stocks down and that provides an opportunity for people buying them. But what are the reasons that someone would bid the stocks down of a high quality company. You know, there's some explanations, which we won't get into here, but they're, they're not nearly as strong. And so it, it's just an interesting factor because on, on one hand, your average investor loves quality. On the other hand, trying to explain why it works behind the scenes is much more difficult for someone like us. And yet I think when you look at like the largest companies in the market, so if you take like the S&P 500 and you break out maybe the top 20 companies um, that have really performed well over the last decade, probably you would mostly put them into this overall overarching quality um, area of investing. But again, they're, you know, it's very tough to define. Maybe some companies had, you know, growing and expanding profits. Uh, other ones, maybe like Amazon just have been growing like gangbusters. And so that's, so those, so there's some growth elements there, but there's also some quality elements there too. So to your point about when investors, you know, normal retail investors, individual investors think about quality, a lot of the companies that they have the most exposure to probably in their own portfolios um, if they're selecting stocks or even in index funds are those types of companies that have really done well and that, you know, have quality characteristics. It's interesting because as, as those, those FANG type companies have matured, they've sort of become more quality companies. So they've always been growth companies, but you know, as they mature and, and as they go, you know, go forward in their development, you know, they have become more quality companies. And so those types of compounding companies do typically exhibit, you know, elements of quality. Um, I think that's true. 
I know we're going to use this AQR framework to define quality and let you get into that. But one of the things I wanted just to mention is, you know, we do run a lot of strategies on Validia and a lot of them have elements of quality embedded in them. So I'm thinking like our Buffett based model based on the book Buffettology that has, you know, consistent profits along with it wants to see a decade worth of higher than average uh, return on equity, return on capital. We have Piotrowski's value investing strategy, which looks at a whole host of accounting uh, improvements across the firm. There are other strategies, even like the Peter Lynch model um, that sort of have like a debt to equity component. So it's trying to reward companies with low levels of debt. So this quality thing within those like, you know, strategies that we run that are based on successful investors and or academic papers, a lot of them are incorporating aspects of quality. But I would say they're there and we'll sort of get into how quality can be can be um, combined with other metrics. And that's sort of at the end. That's what we're going to talk about. But you know, I'm just kind of setting the stage that there's a lot of different ways that quality can kind of come into these various investment strategies. And I think but the AQR um, overview is is probably a really good one. I'll let you kind of sum that up, Jack, because that's really looking at a number of different quality measures and trying to bring them into one sort of definition. Yeah, I'll just read their definition that we pulled from them. And it's a, it says, AQR capital management has defined the quality factor, QMJ, or quality minus junk, to be companies with the following traits. Low earnings volatility, high margins, high asset turnover, indicating efficient use of assets, low financial leverage, low operating leverage, indicating a strong balance sheet and low mac macroeconomic risk, and low stock-specific risk. Volatility is unexplained by macroeconomic activity. So if, if you think about that, sort of the things we've talked about earlier, they're getting at all that. You know, these are typically profitable companies. These are typical, typically companies that have consistency in their sales, consistency in their earnings. They typically, if they use leverage, they use it prudently. They're not over levered in any way. Typically, they have strong balance sheets. So I mean, all of those things, that's sort of a quantitative definition of what you would think about if you, if you think about a quality company. Yeah, and I think the, the challenge for investors, though, is if you look at all those things and you find the companies that score highly based on all those factors or criteria, you know, probably the market's already going to have realized that. And those quality companies tend to get bit up and, you know, they're not necessarily uh, where you're always going to be able to find excess returns because investors are attracted to those types of companies. Um, and, you know, they get more expensive and if they get too expensive, then that become that, you know, that expense, that, that expensiveness, I guess, is, is, you know, not good for the future returns, at least of the stock in some cases. Yeah, that's right. I mean, you, you always have to ask yourself the question, is this priced in? And so typically these types of companies, these quality companies trade at a premium. You know, a good example, we had Vitaly Katzenelson a while back on the podcast, and, you know, he talked about Coke during the Nifty 50 period. And, you know, in, in the period after that sort of Nifty 50 period, I think there was like a 20 year period where you got zero return on your investment in Coke. And Coke was a quality company, you know, growing its earnings and, do, and doing all the things I talked about before during that entire 20 years. But the reason you got zero return on Coke is because the valuation coming in was too high. So th that's sort of an example of, you know, the market usually appreciates quality and sometimes it over appreciates quality. And that's what makes it hard as an investor is, you know, I'm trying to find things that are not appreciated by the market. And, and that's an example that Jason Zhu gave us um, from Raylan Global Advisors when he was on our podcast. He talked about, we asked him sort of the same question we're talking about, which is why would investors, you know, how can investors make money buying quality stocks when there's really no argument or a difficult argument as to why quality would work? And he said, it really comes down to a finding areas of quality or dimensions of quality that are not appreciated by the market. And so he gave the example of high levels of cash. So if firms that tend to have above average levels of cash, you know, tend to run their businesses very prudently. You know, they tend to have, you know, run their businesses conservatively and intelligently. And so he had found that those companies with, with above average levels of cash typically outperformed. And that, that was a measure of quality that actually would produce an excess return over time because it wasn't appreciated by the market. And I think that's an important point is, you know, with all the factors, we're trying to find things that the market doesn't recognize. We're trying to find things that are not priced in already. And I think that's a good example of, of maybe one that would, would fall under quality that might be one of those things. After you wrote your article, I wrote, uh, I reached out to Adam Mead, who wrote the complete financial history of Berkshire Hathaway. We had Adam on the, um, on the podcast um, a few months ago, and I was asking him about sort of quotes or, or Buffett's view on uh, quality companies. Because I think when people think about, you know, Warren Buffett and Larry Cunningham also kind of brought this up when we had him on the podcast, you know, Buffett is probably 
um, the, the one great investor you think of when you know, you're thinking about buying and investing in high quality companies. And so what Adam wrote back to me and he pulled this, I think it was from, a, um, from an annual meeting, but it was uh, where Buffett said, he said, I started out very influenced by ben Graham, Ben Graham. So I emphasized quantitative factors. Charlie Munger came along and said I was all wrong and that he learned more in law than he learned in financial studies and everything and that I should look more at qualitative factors and he was right and Phil Fisher said the same thing. The one thing I've observed with quality is that it is or can be a leading indicator. What management says about how they're going to allocate capital or a strategy that they're going to implement or an economic position of a company and how that's changing. All of that isn't necessarily in the numbers now but importantly it will show up in the numbers in the future or it has to have uh, of real value. So it kind of built, I mean, it's, we're getting into the qualitative aspect of how someone may look at investing and we are a hundred percent systematic and quantitative. So this is far outside of what we believe, you know, most investors can do successfully consistently and re with, you know, re with repeatability over time. But Buffett is obviously different as he's one of the best investors um, ever. But the point is, is that he's saying that there's something that he's seeing now that will help them maintain or improve the quality of the company in the future. So it's something that's hidden that, you know, you can't see it in the surface, but it's going to continue to allow a company to, you know, maybe maintain a higher level of profitability or maybe um, protect its economic moat from competitors. So I don't know, I just thought that was interesting. It kind of reminded me of what Jason said, but it's, it's different since it's qualitative, but that's what Adam sort of gave feedback. And I, I thought that was pretty good. And, you know, as, as quant investors, we always tend to want to quantify everything. And there's certain instances where maybe quantifying it is not the best approach. And, you know, you use some terms in there like it's a leading indicator or it's not in the numbers. And if it's, you know, from what Buffett was saying, and if it's not in the numbers, then we can't quantify it. And so it's very possible that the best way to define quality may be, you know, a very talented investor who knows how to identify it in a company, and, and they're not necessarily just using numbers to do that. Now, as, as you alluded to, we know that's very hard to do. So the, of all the investors that try to do that, you know, many will fail, but there's certainly a possibility that the best way to define quality is not a quantitative definition. And, you know, Ryan Kruger, who we had on the podcast recently as well, you know, had, had a good definition, I thought. And, he, and you know, he, is, he has quantitative aspects to what he does, but he's not a pure quant. And he, he defined quality as, you know, a company that will be doing the same thing it's doing now in 10 years. And th that's a good way to look at it too. You know, those are those solid consistent businesses that, you know, will, will be in the same thing. You know, you know what you're getting now is likely what you're going to be getting then as well. So that's another interesting way to look at it. So I do think it's, it's a reasonable point to say quality may not be best defined quantitatively. There, you know, for a good investor, the qualitative attributes may be more important. One of the things that we're seeing in the market today is the companies or the stocks that have actually been doing the best up until maybe like two months ago were lower quality companies, particularly like in, well, just across the board, but even some of the value stuff that has seen earnings come back a lot, but it was a lot of the value names that were the most beaten down, the most hardest hit from the pandemic. Um, and I wouldn't say many of those were in the high quality sort of camp. They were like, you know, mid to lower quality, which is what made them value stocks probably. But, um, you know, in this market, we're seeing quality um, selling at, you know, sort of, I think we, we, we talked about this last week. It's, it's sort of uh, more of a value than I think it was um, on a relative basis because a lot of these high quality companies really haven't kept pace with some of the lower quality companies. Um, but in terms of how you might be able to screen for those or identify those, um, you know, I know quality can be combined with other valuation metrics and other uh, criteria um, to try to uncover those decent quality, good quality companies where there's some value as well. And, and I think that's the way it's most used. You know, I was thinking when you were talking about the guru models we run on Validity at the beginning, I would say probably 90% plus have some degree of equality criteria. You know, I was having a hard time thinking of, of almost anything that doesn't have some degree of equality criteria. You know, the uh, twin momentum doesn't really, it has earnings growth, you know, or growth in, you know, fundamentals, which may not necessarily be, that's more of a growth criteria. But I think most of them, you know, do have some degree, whether they're value or whether they're growth, do have some elements 
of quality in there. And I think in a lot of ways, that's, you know, how the best investors tend to use quality. They don't say my strategy is to buy high quality companies and pay whatever price I have to pay. You know, they have some other criteria being wrapped around quality is either they're a value investor and they're saying, all right, I want quality, but I'm going to be limited in the price I want to pay for quality. Or they're a growth investor and they're looking for that growth to be combined with quality. So I, I think that's, you know, quality is most often probably used as, as a secondary factor and not necessarily the primary factor, you know, in building portfolios. And that may be kind of the magic sort of formula there is you wait for quality to go on sale. So if you have really high quality companies that you believe, you know, their businesses are um, going to be consistent and they have the characteristics like you talked about before that AQR was highlighting. You know, if you wait for those companies to go on sale, you can really buy a good, good quality company at, you know, what is a discount, hopefully, and then hold it for the long term and, um, you know, hopefully get good returns. Yeah. So I think that's a, you know, good discussion on quality and hopefully, um, you know, we've helped people kind of learn sort of the, the advantages of investing in high quality companies, but also sort of some of the challenges. So, um, thank you guys for listening and we will see you next time. Thank you. Hi guys, this is Justin again. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode of excess returns. You can follow Jack on Twitter at, at practical quant and follow me on Twitter at, at JJ Carboneau. If you found this discussion interesting and valuable, please subscribe in either iTunes or on YouTube or leave a review or a comment. We appreciate it.